mouse. Yeah. Okay. Hang on, I'm not done yet. Okay, sorry. Okay. And, okay. So, my fun words before Jeff takes the microphone are read his books, figure eight, Spider Lake, Bow Cutter, and the new one, Musky Run. In other words, if you want a book with a ton of violence and a guy who rides on trapeze with a machine gun in each hand shooting up the town who says swears, don't read Jeff's books. Anyways, and finally, the man you've been waiting for, <laughs> Jeff Nania! <laughs> That is the first time we've ever done that, but I've got to tell you, I was giving a talk in Green Bay, and I came down from the podium, and I was talking to people on the way, and I got to the book table, and he was signing people's books for her. And this, I said, and this woman was standing there, and she, he says, do you want me to sign your book? She said, yes. And he said, okay. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for coming tonight. I just want to share a couple of pages with you. It's just an appropriate thing to do this time of year. Namakagan County was 1,350 square miles of mostly forests, lakes, rivers, and streams. A stunning landscape with a population of 16,000 citizens. Muskie Falls was the largest city and the county seat. Between Memorial Day and Labor Day, thousands of tourists came to Namakagan County to enjoy the lakes and rivers and hiking and biking trails. This time of year, however, had more of a local flavor. It didn't mean there were no tourists. The contrary was true. The North Country is truly a spectacular sight in fall. Plenty of people came to bask on the autumn colors of smoky gold tamaracks, sugar maples, and poplar leaves quaking in the breeze. Hiking boots, checkerboard flannels, and sweaters replaced shorts, t-shirts, and sandals. The hustle and the bustle of summer was replaced by a slower, seemingly more observant pace. Days grew shorter, and an early snow could come at any time. Fall triggered the hunter-gatherer spirit of most everyone in the North Country. It was time to make sure there was enough wood on the wood pile to get you through spring. Canning jars of blueberries and other wild fruit were counted. Everybody prepared their hunting gear. While camouflage was worn year-round here, this time of year it was more abundant. Hunters were responsible citizens, but come fall, an inordinate number of sick days were used, and the pews on Sundays had a little extra room. School absenteeism was more commonplace than accepted. Anglers anxiously took advantage of the mild fall weather and piled the waters, plied the waters of the northern lakes for fall-fattened muskies and walleyes. Hunting seasons for rough grouse, bear, deer, and waterfowl had opened or would soon. Most conversations at the Moose Cafe and Crosswaite's Coffer centered on the upcoming or ongoing hunting seasons. There was an entire group of citizens who became more visible in the fall. It seemed that everyone in Namakagan County owned a dog or two, and I wouldn't be surprised if the canine citizens outnumbered the human ones. Hound dogs stuck their heads out of the openings of dog boxes in the back of pickup trucks. They were anxious and ready to travel the back country with the handler, sorting out thousands of scents, looking for the one they live for, the smell of a bear announcing success with hound dog howls. The northern lakes and rivers were also a destination for waterfall hunters. Wild rice, cloages, big water, and shallow wetlands host thousands of ducks and geese during the fall migration. Water dogs, mostly labs and chesapeakes, 
were the choice of waterfowlers. These dogs were unfazed by the cold weather, and they lived to retrieve ducks and geese knocked down by their hunter. Bird dogs rode, rode in the back seats or portable kennels. Pointers and close-working flushers were ready to go in search of rough grouse and woodcock. Bird populations were high, some say the best in over a decade. With all the thousands of acres of land open to the public, even the most determined hunter could not hunt at all in a lifetime. One of my goals in writing these books has been to go on each page with you. We share this. When you're reading this book, you're not just reading my book. I hope we're sharing our lives. In talking to someone before this book was written, I learned, I got interested in something. Words. I mean, I know, you're saying, hey, dummy, you're a writer. But, I mean, words. So I wrote feature stories. And um, before this, not really a career, but I did it. And I met some wonderful people. But in a feature story, you've got 1,100 or 1,200 or 1,500 words. And how do you tell somebody's story? So let me just tell you about this guy. The editor of the Wisconsin Outdoor News got a note, a handwritten note, that said, I was just thinking about how it was that I was walking through the woods with my gun after returning from World War II and no one was shooting at me. He said it was a wonderful feeling. It was a homestead farm, five generations. So I tracked this guy down. He answers his phone and says, I said, I'd like to come and talk to you. I'd like to interview you. He goes, yeah, okay. That might be all right. He said, but you better hurry. He said, I'm 96 years old, going on 97. You can't tell what's going to happen tomorrow. So I went to see this guy. And I realized right then that some stories can't be told in 1,500 words. He told me a great story, a wonderful story. It didn't start out so wonderful. He and his unit were a bunch of kids from Wisconsin, 17, 18, 19 years old, near the end of World War II. And you know what their job was? To empty the concentration camps. He said, we first got there and we couldn't imagine what was right in front of us. And once they were in saving people who were still breathing, they were attacked. And this guy, John, was wounded badly. Well, eventually he was transferred to a hospital in Michigan. And he told the story like this. He said, I was laying in my hospital bed, just feeling better, getting a little recovered. And I looked up and I saw an angel. Now, I was in law enforcement for a long time and I've heard all sorts of near-death experiences and things like that, and I sure don't discount them. I said, you did? You did, John? Yeah. Yeah, he says, and you know what? I said, no, what? He said, I was married to her for 63 years. (laughs) I said, who was it? I said, you married your nurse? Yeah, I sure did. But he taught me a lesson about words. And I want to share something. It's just, so 
And if you just don't like what I'm sharing, it won't take too long. <laughs> but So how can words be important, and how can they have meaning? So if you were required to condense thoughts into the best form and still communicate, it is a difficult task. It should be the task of every writer. The story I think you should tell, you know, Samuel Clements, Mark Twain, said, writer's words are the same as an artist's brushstroke. Every stroke on that painting takes a space. Every color. It has its place there, or doesn't it? I got thinking a lot about this, and I started doing a bunch of research. Just, I wanted to know. So you know some interesting, interesting things? Let's go back to 1863. How about that? On November 19th, at the Soldiers Natural National Cemetery in Pennsylvania, Edward Everett, a famous orator and speaker at the time, gave a speech two hours long to 16,000 people. How many people here have ever heard of Edward Everett. I'll be darned. I bet you heard of the guy who came after him. After the, the applause died down, the next speaker took the podium. He came up and he turned his back on the audience and faced 3,500 gravestones of soldiers killed in the Civil War. He gave a speech. 271 words. It became the Gettysburg Address. The speaker was Abraham Lincoln. What a remarkable thing. So then, I found a conspiracy. I know, but it's true. It's a conservation conspiracy. So after World War II, things were controversial. Just like Lincoln, had he lived, would have has said himself, he would have faced the challenge of turning battlefields back into crop fields. Land use became a big issue in our country. And writing about land use and writing about conservation in many regards was verboten. People didn't want to hear it. <laughs> but this is propaganda. This is a pamphlet that was published by the Wisconsin Conservation Department, which was before the Wisconsin DNR, called A History of Wisconsin Deer. How could this be controversial? I mean, we argue back and forth about deer, but how could this be controversial? Well, the writers of this book were not just anybody. I spent a long time in conservation and I worked in the field all the time, not interested in being in the office. So the dedication of this book is dedicated to those rugged citizens who down through the years had the courage to fight for preservation of our natural resources. 22 words. Later on, hidden in the text, it says, 
first teach a child the value of work, not regimented play. Teach him that a sunset over a verdant countryside has more intrinsic value than the most costly painting. Teach him that bread comes from the soil, not from the store. But the back, the back, is what caused all the controversy. Back of this color publication, which at that time was unheard of, and it says, democracy is safest in the hands of a people who love and conserve their out of doors. So, this for the back part of this was written by a guy you may have heard of. His name was Aldo Leopold. Ernest Swift wrote part of it, and G.A.R. wrote the other part. The greatest conservationists felt it was important enough to get this message out. It's funny that Ernie Swift commented back when this came out. He said, well, I knew it was going to be controversy controversial because basically he said there's going to be a bunch of legislators sitting on their pants in downtown Madison not doing anything while the world goes on. But they'll find bigger words to describe it. I hope that I can learn to write like that. I hope that I can figure out a way to say so much with so little. Now, I don't want the books to be nine pages, so I've got to do something about that. You know, when I first wrote this book, the first book I wrote was a book called Figure Eight. I didn't even know I was going to write the book, to be honest with you. My family, when, my, when I was a kid, no, actually, it was before I was born, when my brother, oldest brother was a kid, my dad and a friend of his were grouse hunting in northern Wisconsin. They had uh, looking for a place to stay that night, and they stopped at an old gas station. The guy says, there's a work camp down the road. The guy is turning it into a resort. Go there, and you can stay there, and he'll probably feed you breakfast in the morning. So that's what my dad and this guy did. They went down there and stayed at a cabin, and they got up the next morning, and here was this absolutely stunning lake. I mean, there's nothing, nowhere has lakes like northern Wisconsin and this beautiful lake. And my dad said, well, I have a son. Can I bring him back here in the summer? My wife and my son. Well, sure, that's just what I want. I want people, I want families to come here. I want them to enjoy all this. That started a tradition in our family that has lasted 70 years seven years. So we all have cabins there. I have a brother next door to me, another brother next door to me. Um, we had, my mom, my mom had five boys. Yeah, I know. She used to take tranquilizers by the handful. <laughs> Although I've got to say in my own defense, my brothers were pretty rowdy. I was a great kid and I can prove it. She said to me, I hope that someday, when you have children, you have a child like you. I thought, well, that's, that's pretty good. But it connected our family with this place. After I left law enforcement and went into conservation, I was the head of the wetland restoration field team for over 20 years. It allowed me the chance to change our landscape for the better. To put these projects back on the ground in a way that it's overwhelming to think that generations from now, people look at these projects. And I realized that it was critical for us to do something. We had failed. It's our generation that failed. I'm sorry to tell you that, but it is. 
And how we failed is this. We made it difficult for kids to connect the outdoors. Not all families, but some. We had the responsibility to do that, to give them the chance to make change. I gave a talk to a high school commencement, and they were talking about, before this, about the box, staying in the box, working in the box. I said, why? Why do you have to devote your life to a box that someone else built? Why can't you go forward and make these choices knowing that you're making choices not for an individual generation, not for two, not for three, not for four, but for many? How about that? And so we've worked very hard at that and started working with my wife. We had started... Um, project-based environmental charter schools. Schools that the kids, you know, I, I love it. The school districts go like this. You got any kids that might work then? Oh yeah, as a matter of fact, and they just take that broom and they just sweep those kids who aren't good conventional learners or kids that don't fit their mold and they just sweep them over there. Here you go, you can have them all. We hold our arms out and embrace them. And the connection those kids have with the outdoors has lasted them through their careers. We have scientists, we have, but they're all still connected to the outdoors. And that is probably the best thing, other than having a family, I'll ever do in my life. The remarkable kids. We had, you know, we had this girl, so she got in trouble coming to school late all the time. Well, nobody ever asked her why. Nobody ever asked her about her drug-addicted mother that she was taking care of. Nobody ever asked her about her eight-year-old brother that she was taking care of and getting out of school. Nobody ever asked her. And you know what? She thought she was stupid. We told her and all our kids, no, the only people who are stupid are the ones that think you are. Archaeologists now. Got a bachelor's degree in archaeology, Florida State. So she still has this foundation in the outer doors. And it's been a wonderful thing for us. Now, we should talk about writing. But, <laughs> you know, I don't know what you want to know. I don't know much. And if you ask hard questions and I don't know the answer, I'll just make something up. So save yourself. Did anybody have any questions? Yes. Yeah, that's the other thing you can talk about. But I know that Muskie Run and Namakagan County are fictitious. If you had to put them on the map in Wisconsin, where would they be? I don't know. I've been asked that before. Uh, well, so the mayor of, a, of Hayward claims it's Hayward. Okay. I know where that is. Now. Yeah. And... The guy who owns the jewelry store across the street, he claims it's Hayward too. Which is again, listen, I can only, I can only, these are fictitious accounts. You know what happened to me? I was signing books up at Cable, Wisconsin at a Redbury bookstore. And this, in one of the books, um, there's a kind of a swarthy DE agent, Department of Narcotics Enforcement agent, and he's, this guy walks in, or I'm signing books, he goes, I'm that agent in your book, aren't I? And I knew him, and I said, no, you weren't. No, 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 the agent in the book was a good investigator. <laughs> so, Namakagan County and Muskie Falls are a place where you and I can sit down outside 
and have a cup of coffee and feel the fall air where people still say hello to you and they wave when they drive by you, that's where it is. Any other questions? I'll get back here. So as far as another book goes, the truth is that the first book, so I told you about our family get-together where we go up and we get this together on this lake. We still do that, by the way. We all get there and fish muskies and have a great time. We just have a great time. And uh, every year I would buy a case of mystery books from a local author. And I'd hand them out to everybody, all the kids, and we'd read them together. We wouldn't sit together and read them, but, you know, I'd say, what chapter are you on? So um, that author did not write a book, and I wrote figure eight. I just sat down and wrote figure eight. I never, I've never written with an outline. Um, I am not a conventional writer. They call us outlier writers. But I just wrote the book figure eight. And um, the first publisher looked at it and turned it down flat. And the second one said, you know, I think this is something we can work with. And a small publisher, publishing house in Wisconsin, a small printer in Tony, Wisconsin, does all the printing. Um, and it became a book. So as far as the next book goes, I can't honestly tell you. I was swimming across the lake, and I had a pretty good thought about it. But you just never know. In, in uh, Muskie Run, we talk a lot about, and this won't spoil the book for anyone, we talk a lot about the relationship between people and wildlife. We seem to have this ongoing battle about who is in charge. And Aldo Leopold and those guys have long stated, and we know that there's a balance. We have to find a balance. We have to find a way for everybody to live together because the alternative doesn't work. You know, I mean, a guy was talking to me about the wolf issue in northern Wisconsin. I mean, you can't look in the newspaper without seeing something about wolves. You know, as smart as those wolves are, they could never envision that their fate is in a courtroom. They could never understand of a judge in a robe or lawyers talking about their future. And I think that we, ha we can do better than that. I think as citizens as people who love the outdoors, we can find better solutions. We can find better balance, but we have to work together. Um, I've been a hunter safety instructor for about 35 years, and I've done mentor hunting and all sorts of things like that to connect the kids to the outdoors. And I was so disappointed when I got an email yesterday, or the day before yesterday, that asked for volunteer hunter safety instructors. They don't have enough instructors to teach the classes. And the classes clearly have led to safer hunting, and not necessarily even hunting. I have lots of classes people take just to take it, and just to connect. But I was very disappointed that the Department of Natural Resources had ended up at this spot. So I was asked by a publication to consider writing something about a solution.
I thought one of the things that'd be good is how about anybody 65 or older that's had a hunting license for five years gets a free patron's license for teaching a hunter safety class. All of a sudden, we're engaging these people who have got tons of knowledge and are more than willing to share it. And let's make it easy. How about the schools? In our schools, Hunter Safety, in our Hayward School in particular, Hunter Safety is part of the curriculum, but we can't count it as a science curriculum. It's science. Why not? Why don't we think about that? And we hope that some of these are going to be solutions, but our bottom line is this. The only thing we can do is we have to make this connection with our kids. We have to do what we can do and let them understand we are they're empowered. They're the generation that's going to do things. Well, I want to thank you very much for coming here tonight. I'd still answer any questions. And um, I want you to do me one favor. If you get the chance, just take a kid outdoors. Take him for a walk. Take him to pick acorns up, see how far they can throw them. Take him to a dock and bait a hook for bluegills. Whatever you can do, but just take him outside. I, you know what? It's as contagious as COVID. So thank you very much. I appreciate you coming tonight. Yes. I am a, a, an avid reader. My favorite book is Rascal by Sterling North. Sterling North wrote this book in southern Wisconsin, Albion, Wisconsin, Edgerton area, and it's about life during World War I in this little country town. And it's supposed to be about a, guy, a kid with a pet raccoon. But really what it's about is life. It is so well written. Sterling North, the author, won tons of awards for the book. And, you know, I really like that one. But I like all books. I, I don't like painful books. And I also am not interested, just like my son said, um, if you want a guy who's going to swing through the trees in downtown with machine guns, don't read my books. If you want somebody who every second word in the text is an obscenity, don't read my books. If you want graphic violence, if you want to be scared to death, don't read my books. If you want a story, you know John Cabrelli, he's a friend of mine. I don't even know the guy, but he's become a friend of mine. You know, when in figure eight, when he's patrolling the beat, I was there. I was on the same street. And it's kind of a remarkable thing. Um, I'm sure that if some psychiatrist got a hold of me and said, uh, so you have this fictional friend? I would say it, he is fictional, and as a matter of fact, I indicate at the beginning of every book. But it's fun. Any other questions? Yes. They're great books. I love the characters and the character development. Um, I just wanted to say that, you know, they're um, w one of the things that I, I kind of agree with you. I like pretty much all books, and I, I always, it's always kind of eye opening to like um, be introduced to books that you wouldn't normally, you know, gravitate towards. I mean, I'm not a hunter, I'm, you know, law enforcement is out of my, <laughs> out of my, <laughs> Um, 
you know, purview. Um, but I, I really um, resonated with the um, environmental and uh, the conservation, you know, part. And, and I wanted to mention the last I read Musky Run um, already, and um, it really struck a chord with me because I've also read a book called The Cat Tales, which is about the pa the um, Florida Panthers. You pie, bet. Which is <laughs> it just it gives me the shakes on my feet about that. Um, but uh, yeah, that was you know just interesting and and stuff. So well, it's it's remarkable. But um, in book four, there's a character in there that is a furry character with paws. And since I wrote book four, I get lots of connections with people who say, "Hey, you know what I found on my trail camera?" And it's it's remarkable. Um, and you know, it's an example of us trying to find our way. Um, we've never been successful eliminating any species. We probably won't be successful now. But we have been successful in restoring habitat and allowing, you know, in Wisconsin now, we, one of the, I worked in the legislature for 13 years, advisory to the legislature, nonpartisan, um, on conservation bills. And, um, you know, we signed a, bill into law, and the day that that became law, 500,000 acres of land was open to the public. You, could, you can't walk. You can't visit all the land we have here. And it's going to be that way for a long, long time. And that is the kind of legacy. But you know what? It was all us. All people our age who drove that home. And that's a pretty powerful thing. So thank you very much. I'm glad you liked the books. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much for coming. I'll be around. And if you don't want me to sign your books, J. John will sign them for you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much.